Good morning and welcome to ASPE. Today it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Russell Trude, who is Professor of International Relations at Griffith University and Director of the Griffith Asia Institute. Together with Anthony Bergen, they have written a new report for ASPE on the role of Parliament in national security affairs. Anthony is the Deputy Director here at ASPE in Canberra and Russell has had long experience in the Parliament as a Senator before his current job serving on some of these parliamentary committees which they have reported on. Gentlemen, national security is traditionally the sphere of the executive. At a time when respect for the Parliament is at a low ebb and the Senate is particularly fractious, why do you want the Parliament to have a larger role on these issues? Perhaps I could start with you, Russell. Well, uh, thank you, Patrick, and, and good morning. It's a, it's a delight to be able to talk to you this morning. Um, well, I think there are, there are many reasons for, for this, but it, it actually goes to the, the heart of this is to improving the, the foundations of um, the respectability of our institutions of government. Um, but beyond that, in relation to national security more particularly, I think there's a, a, a role for the parliament to play in relation to executive accountability, um, in relation to, to oversight. Um, and, and although the, uh, as you rightly say, the executive has primary responsibility with regard to the um, development and implementation of foreign policy, um, I do think there is an important role for the parliament to play in relation to uh, contributing to, pol to policy, uh, exploring new policy issues, for example. Um, there are, there's a, quite a long tradition of the parliament playing a role in relation to these matters, foreign policy, defence and what we now call national security. Uh, and I do think that this can be uh, an important part of the responsibilities that Parliament un undertakes. And, and I think by exercising this capacity that the Parliament has, uh, it will Im improve the integrity. I think it has the capacity to improve the integrity of the institution. Anthony? Well, there, there's only two points uh, I would add here, Patrick, to what Russell said. The first, I think, is that some of these national security issues are becoming far more complex and challenging. Uh, they range from not just uh, traditional areas such as defence and foreign affairs, but of course issues to do with counter-terrorism, cyber security, border management and so on. And I think, as Russell said, uh, trying to leverage uh, the parliament uh, to improve accountability and to uh, uh, engage the, the public in, in a more informed discussion on these issues is most important. So I think it's a combination of the, the complexity uh, and the range of national security issues we're now facing that we need to draw upon uh, the Parliament. Your strategic insight paper published today looks at the role of the Parliament when it comes to the exercise of war powers. This is an issue we know has been strongly debated in the UK and elsewhere. To what extent do you think the Australian Parliament should have some say in the overseas deployment of the ADF in wartime? Well, Patrick, as you rightly say, the, 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 there seems to be something of a, uh, an international trend towards uh, legislatures uh, taking a greater role in relation to the overseas deployment of forces. Um, I must say I'm a rather, skept rather sceptical about the value of this. Um, indeed, um, Anthony and I have both written on this subject. Um, I, I, I see the arguments that those who make the case have made, but I, I do think that uh, foreign policy and national security is a, is a unique responsibility of government. And governments, of course, are elected to govern. And, and nothing is more important, I don't think, than the responsibility that governments undertake to uh, engage their countries in, in conflict or, or send forces to war. So I, I, I'm very comfortable with the fact that governments make these, thing, make these decisions um, responsibly, responsibly. They don't make the decisions lightly. Um, they uh, make the decisions in the context of all the circumstances and 
it's very difficult, I think, for for parliaments to to have all the knowledge that might bear upon a decision of this kind. So, uh, I, while I, as I say, while I'm familiar with the arguments, uh, I'm not persuaded by them. I guess the only point I would add here is that we are certainly not arguing that there ought not to be a greater use of parliament uh, when it comes to debating issues to do with. Uh, uh, the operations of the ADF. In fact, we, we argue that there should be more regular ministerial statements and so forth. And uh, we note in the paper too, Patrick, that uh, there's been an unfortunate tendency in recent years for both sides of politics to bypass the parliament when making significant defence and national security statements, such as, for example, the, t the launch of the 2013 Defence White Paper uh, uh, at Fairbairn Air Base and the, the, uh, the recent uh, or the, the announcement earlier this year by the Prime Minister of a suite of counter-terrorism measures at the Australian Federal Police Headquarters. So we would like Parliament um, to be the setting, if you like, for the uh, announcement and, and dissemination of these important defence and sec national security statements. Yeah, and that, that's an important point to reinforce, Patrick, that um, un unfortunately over a period of time there seemed to be an inclination amongst ministers, and, and as, as Anthony says, on both sides, to to make these important announcements elsewhere. And of course, we all understand the the pressure and the and the imperatives um, that the media drives here. Um, but I do think the one of the consequences has been that um, Parliament has been bypassed on rather too many occasions. So, the opportunity which would previously have been given um, for senators and members to speak on issues. Uh, tends to be removed when uh, statements, um, statements of policy and things of that kind are, are not actually introduced into the parliament. Look, having looked at parliamentary committees over the last 30 years or so, I have to say I've often been dismayed by the level of expertise of MPs and senators when it actually comes to these kind of committee hearings. It's a stark contrast with Washington. How do you think we can improve this state of affairs so that our parliamentarians can actually ask more pertinent questions and actually contribute to more effective policy making? Well, it, you're, you're right. That, uh, that Look, compared to the number of lawyers, for example, or union officials and, thing, and people like that um, who have entered the parliament, the, the, the number of people uh, who uh, become either members of the House or, or indeed senators um, with some kind of expertise in international affairs, uh, it, it's it's very limited, and and indeed, there, 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 frankly, there aren't many incentives for people with those kind of qualifications to to enter the parliament if indeed they wish to uh, practice their their art or or their interest. So um, there there is a real problem here, I think, with the level of knowledge and and understanding, and and so our, our paper focuses on that question. Um, and encourages the parliament to think in terms of how we might actually uh, improve the knowledge of people who come to the parliament with, with all of the best intentions and who may well become or acquire an interest in international affairs while, be, while, while members. Um, how can we act, what, what can we actually do to improve the, the level of their understanding and their knowledge? And, and so we make some suggestions in relation to... Um, um, stronger briefings or or or, or um, briefings by agencies of government, um, and and when we when we did our uh, when we uh, took evidence in relation to the to the research, there were um, a couple of people in in some of the key agencies, national security agencies, uh, who who made it clear that um, they regard the education of Parliament as an important part of their own contribution to policy. So far, far from saying, well, we, we, we prefer ignorant parliamentarians, they were making the point that we would much prefer the capacity to be able to, to better inform parliamentarians, to provide information about the agencies and things they're doing, the, the primary policy objectives they had, things of that kind. So I think that's a, that's a good place to start, in, improve the interaction um, between members of parliament and um, the agencies of national security. Yes. Anthony, do you have a view on that? Well, I think it's a, it's a sad fact, but it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it is a fact that um, uh, for most uh, parliamentarians, there's not, as Russell said, a strong incentive 
to become experts on uh, defence or foreign affairs or security issues, um, the incentives lie much more in becoming experts on tax or health or the environment and so forth. So going to Russell's point uh, and your question, uh, we, we, ar we argue in the paper for a whole series of measures to try and strengthen uh, the expertise and incentives for parliamentarians to take on uh, th this issue area as, as, as one where they can become uh, across the detail so that they can contribute much better to public policy. You've said that each of our parliamentary committees charged with examining national security issues is a need of reform, particularly when it comes to our intelligence agencies. What do you actually have in mind when it comes to the oversight of ASIO, ASIS and the other agencies? Well, the, the, um, the Parliamentary Committee on Intelligence and Security is, is, a, is an important innovation in the Parliament's capacity to, to scrutinise and provide oversight and, and I welcome that and I, I sat on that committee and, and I thought it was a very effective committee. Uh, it was a bipartisan committee. Um, it was a committee where uh, each and every member of the committee took their responsibilities uh, very seriously and um, and most most notably, I suppose, it was a committee where there was there was hardly a whiff of of partisanship in the way in which we approached the the tasks which were before us. Um, but the and and that that committee has responsibility for looking at all six of the the key intelligence agencies, um, but it has a very limited mandate and and it's a mandate which I think um, deserve it, it requires some examination. Uh, it it is it is now a very it's a limited mandate, but but almost um, uh, a very modest mandate, a conservative mandate in the context of the capacity that's being given to other parliaments, not least the, the parliament in Westminster, where the, the equivalent committee has just had quite a significant reform, which has offered, which, which has provided the committee with the capacity, if it chooses to do so, um, to look into operational matters. Now, I'm not necessarily suggesting, or we are not necessarily suggesting in our paper, um, that, 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 that that is desirable, but the the mandate of the Intelligence Committee um, has barely been, uh, I think I'm right in saying uh, it hasn't been uh, reformed, it hasn't been examined since the committee was established. Uh, and, and, and as we argue in the paper, with the committee assuming uh, greater responsibilities, um, mm. undertaking a more active role, in, and indeed it, I think as, as we speak it's, it's looking at the new um, tranche of counter-terrorism um, legislation. So a as those responsibilities have increased, I, I do think there's a case for, at, at the very least, examining the mandate and determining whether or not there might not be a need to um, to look more closely at the extent to which the, the p committee's powers might be extended uh, into the oversight area. The only thing I would add there is that um, we're not suggesting that Australia adopt uh, in any way the American congressional uh, role of intelligence oversight because I think our two systems are different. But to underline Russell's point, what we did look at in the paper was some of the changes in, in Westminster. And as Russell said, um, in many ways the equivalent committee uh, in Westminster has uh, dramatically expanded its powers and as, as, uh, as, as Russell uh, said, it now looks at the intelligence operations uh, in the UK as well. So I think that is one of the reasons why we were comfortable in suggesting there should be some review um, of the parliamentary committees as it relates to intelligence oversight. Anthony, your report's had quite a lot to say about improving reports and publications mm -hmm. by the four committees in this sphere. It's hard to recall, in fact, looking back on more than a handful of reports which have had real impact. Mm -hmm. How do you think we can actually lift the impact of these reports that are produced by committees like the Joint Foreign Affairs and Trade Committee? In the course of uh, undertaking this study, as, as Russell said, we, we did interview uh, many people from, uh, from the bureaucracy, uh, from, from the media and other areas to, to test the impact of uh, the committee's reports. And I think it's fair to say that for the most part, 
uh, your judgment is correct that um, the committee reports, while they're well prepared, uh, have not necessarily had the impact that was warranted by the amount of effort uh, that went into the hearings and so forth. And I think one of the one of the reasons for that, of course, is that the committee reports, by necessity, for the most part. Um, have to re respond to the information that was, has been provided to them. So they often read on the one hand, on the other hand type reports, which is good of course for think tanks like ASPE where we can come out with a strong line in, 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 in a report. Um, so in our, in our paper we've recommended, for example, one of the ways to enhance the impact of the reports might be to undertake some uh, added training, uh, some, some capacity building, if you like, with the uh, chairman of the committees and their staff to improve the readability, the, the, uh, the cogency, if you like, the literacy, not that they're, not that they're illiterate reports, far from it, but uh, to try and lift the, uh, uh, the accessibility to readers um, so that they, they better reflect the amount of investment that's gone into the preparation. So it, it really revolves around trying to uh, invest some resources in training chairs, uh, those people that are, that are involved in preparing and writing the reports um, so that they can have, as you say, a bigger, bigger impact. Russell, would you like to add to that answer? Yeah, look, uh, there, there are a couple of things here, Patrick. Uh, the, the first thing I think you should say is that the, the committees are al al almost uh, um, without exception uh, extremely well served by the, the secretariats which are available to them and, and they work uh, extremely hard in producing, um, in, in running any, any inquiry and, and, and contribute significantly to the, to the nature of the report. So uh, any observations we make here are certainly not intended to be reflected on the professionalism of the committees, which is, in my experience, very high. Um, uh, it, 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 is a, it is rather alarming, though, Patrick, when um, we're making, when we were uh, discussing some of these issues with uh, senior members of some agencies where uh, we, we, have, we received on a couple of occasions some, fair, from some fairly frank confessions or, or acknowledgements that the parliamentary reports um, were not things they spent a lot of time, but it wasn't the last thing they read on the way to bed at night. Um, there, there is a need to to try and Im improve the. I think they they tend to be written according to a a very standard formula, um, rather than being um, cast in a way which um, perhaps might better suit particular circumstances. So I think the the parliament, uh, insofar as it's possible, needs to be a bit more creative in the way in which it it writes reports. Your report has actually outlined seven measures by which you think you can improve the Parliament's input into the conduct of national security policy. Which of those would you actually rate as the most important priority? Look, the way we um, set out the, the recommendations, uh, uh, we didn't prioritise the measures that we suggested, uh, mainly I su really because really they're, they're, they're interconnected, uh, they're a package deal if you like rather than a smorgasbord. Um, I guess two areas perhaps that I'd highlight and, and uh, uh, my co-author may have a slightly different view on this but, but two areas perhaps I would highlight. One is the area of enhancing what we call parliamentary diplomacy. That is trying to leverage uh, parliamentarians much more uh, in, in international uh, policy, whether it be uh, uh, participating in delegations, negotiating uh, uh, treaties, whether it be uh, where there is particular expertise from, from members or senators, using them on, on particular overseas missions, etc. So trying to enhance the role of, of parliamentarians in, um, in, in external uh, affairs would be one area. The second area that I'd perhaps highlight um, and it goes to, to Russell's point about the professionalism of committee staff, but we would like to see a much greater secondment interchange uh, between subject matter experts in the various uh, security agencies of government to work with parliamentarians. Not only would that enhance, of course, the, uh, the work of the committee itself, but we believe that it would also enhance the understanding of our national security agencies of the work of parliament. Yeah, well, look, I, I certainly support those um, um, 
that, that view because I think they are they are critical things. I, th I think the important thing here to recollect or to remember is that um, the, the the Parliament uh, has acquired these this capacity in the area of national security in relation to foreign policy, defence, etc. Um, over a, over a period of time, and so the the measures that are in place or the arrangements in relation to committees which are in place um, tend to have been developed uh, in a rather serendipitous way, in a, in a rather ad hoc way. They've been subject to kind of uh, different reforms on, on different occasions. Committees have been created, and um, such as the Intelligence Committee, um, in response to particular perceived imperatives at the time. So um, the, 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 in, in some respects, this might perhaps be a, a strength of, of the system. Um, but my view is very much the case that um, that a single change is probably not going to make all that di much difference to the to the work of the of the parliament. But a, a more comprehensive view of uh, of um, a more, more comprehensive um, implementation of reform um, could considerably improve its capacity in relation to to national security. Um, they don't all have to be done at once, uh, but a uh, a, a series of, of changes which uh, address the, the, what we see as the, the, the shortcomings uh, in our, uh, as, in, in, as set out in our paper, um, I think have the capacity to uh, considerably enhance the, the Parliament's role. And, and I think that's in the, in the broader national interest and, and I think it's uh, in the Parliament's interest. Russell, Anthony, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Patrick. Thanks, Patrick.